something I've had to work on too. Um, is I always see stuff like that and I'm like, I can't complain. This guy lost his whole family, but you do need to allow yourself to feel things, even if they're not big. Like, it's like, I can't downplay my wife almost dying because somebody did lose his wife. I can't say, yeah. well, I'm not allowed to mourn or I'm not allowed to deal with this because, or I'm not allowed to say this sucks because how can I say this sucks when somebody actually did lose their wife? And I think that's something that also drove me insane. I always had that attitude of like, well, how can I complain? I had a great upbringing. What's up, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Trevor Talks. I'm your host, Trevor Tyson, and I'm super thrilled that you're taking time out of your day to join us for this very stoic and important interview. And one thing that you're going to notice is semi-midway through, maybe a little bit earlier than midway, there's going to be a wardrobe change because you know what? Life happens, and sometimes we have to space interviews out into two days because they're just going so great. So it's one of those things that just bear with us. It's a phenomenal conversation and I'm so excited about it. Today's guest is the front man for one of my favorite bands that a lot of you are probably familiar with if you're super into metalcore like I am. But if you're not, you know what? Don't go anywhere because he he sounds very gentle in this interview, but the music is heavy and it's freaking phenomenal. The band is fit for a king and they have a new record coming out on October 28th called the hell we create so please help me welcome mr ryan kirby ryan how are you man i'm doing well and it's just gentle because i have to save all that for the gutturals it's like you got to charge it up so right now i'm recharging for the next leg of our i prevail tour dude it's incredible the 24 second scream I, i don't even know how to put it into words it just sounds like i would fall on the floor purple if I tried to do that. So I can't imagine going into that, but man, you're about to go into the second leg of the I prevail tour. The first leg has already happened. How are you feeling about the rest of it? I'm honestly like, I enjoy the break, but at the same time I was feeling great whenever the leg ended. And I'm somebody that when I feel like we're on a roll, I like routine. I would have preferred to just knock out the whole tour. (laughs) But when we were young fest, we weren't invited. Yeah. So we get a nice two weeks off and then uh, actually Sunday fly back out to L.A. to kick off the second half. Dude, it's incredible. And the hell we create is coming out in just a few weeks from this interview. How are you feeling about it? I'm so excited for people to hear the whole record. I think it's a it's a record that can only I think more than any of our other records, the full record needs a listen through to get the yeah. full context, because I. Yeah. feel like the album is beyond the diversity of it. I just think there's so many themes and messages and it's a journey. And uh, like I, I just think it needs a sit down for a lot of people to fully understand like where those singles fit in. Yeah, especially from front to back, people are going to be able to appreciate this thing as a whole. And this new record is a collection of songs pretty much inspired from, by some pretty significant events, which we walked through in this interview. And I'm just, I'm thrilled that you took time to finish this thing off and that we got to do a little wardrobe changey change yeah. in it. You know what? People get sick and you have to pick them up at school. And then, um, We even get to meet your cat. So I'm excited about this. Everybody, Ryan Kirby, dude, I love you. That's just it. So everybody, enjoy the rest of this. (laughs) So this new record, I really want to talk about it, The Hell We Create. But before we get into it, our audience is primarily in the faith-based spectrum. So I really want to talk about the name of the record, kind of the meaning behind it for you, and uh, where some of the inspiration for these songs came from. So a lot of the inspiration uh, obviously came from the pandemic. It's inevitable to have an album with pandemic-related things happening. It's just a matter of if you call the songs virus or outbreak or not, which we did refrain (laughs) from any uh, virus-themed songs. Thank you. Thank you. The the Hell We Create is kind of just a bunch of different trials, not just that I went through, but my wife and... Uh, the kids that we adopted right before the pandemic. So we adopted two kids. So I guess I can break it into layers. I think there's about three layers of the hell we create. The first layer 
is uh, the decisions we make and the hell it can create for others. Um, that example is the kids. They they obviously, uh, we adopted them for a reason. They went through a lot of stuff, abuse with parents, 17 different uh, foster homes and shelters and 17 different placements, which then, uh, so the parents' decision to drink and to abuse alcohol or to abuse alcohol and to physically abuse them resulted in the kids own hell as you can, which is three years of switching homes constantly, which, uh, at the time we adopted them, they were eight and 13. So at an age where, you know, especially at 13, you're definitely absorbing everything that's happening. Um, so I'd say that's the first layer, just like personal decisions and how they can affect others and yourself. Cause obviously the parents, uh, losing your kids, whether, because now like, um, the dad is sober and everything, but at the end of the day, you lost your kids and you, it's hard to take that back after all the things that happened and he's going to have to live with that. And that's kind of like a self-inflicted quote unquote hell he's put on himself, like separation from his children and all that. Uh, so it's just kind of like things people can reflect on, like even things as small as, and I had to learn all these stats too, before fostering and then adopting about like the grade of graduation among children whose parents didn't graduate. So it's like the decision of the parents to not push through school, which there are some extenuating circumstances where kids have had to drop out to help their sick parents and stuff like yeah. that. But it then usually results in children. I think it's seven out of 10 times not graduating oh. high school. Sure. And it's just like all these crazy stats of like, if the parents did this, the chance of the kids doing this is also really high. So it's like yeah. how our personal decisions can create quote unquote hells for other people. Um, the second layer is we create hell for ourselves through anxiety. Um, and I did this a lot during the pandemic uh, because I was making these crazy thoughts in my head of like touring will never return. No one's going to care about our band. My whole career of music just ended in the blink of an eye. Like, and it was driving me crazy because it like wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything to lose my career. We just had a pandemic and that was just it. So I, that was the first of the anxiety things, which it ended up not being true. Our band's touring. People still do care. I'm on this podcast. <laughs> because people care. I care. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like, man, I lost probably a year of sleep over something that ended up not even being true. I, like, created this hell scenario in my head of, like, my world collapsing. And and then um, on the flip side, my wife getting, um, she had a stroke and nearly died. And she's still not fully better. She's about to have another brain surgery next month. And she's on her third brain surgery now. So I, it's always a mix. It's always mixed feelings. And he's like, glad she's doing good. And I'm like, she's not dead. Yeah. So that's good. But she's still fighting through it and still in a lot of pain years later. So I think, uh, and then I like started, I developed hypochondria after her sickness where I kept thinking things were wrong with me. And I got to the point, because my dad had esophageal cancer. I've had esophagus issues throughout my life. Um, I had already lost like a healthy amount of weight to help mm -hmm. with those issues. But then during the pandemic, I like, because stress can cause swallowing issues, I was attributing it to, I have cancer too. My dad had cancer. I have it now. I got to the point where I just wasn't eating because I was so scared to eat anything because it was going to make whatever I had worse. I got down to like 135 pounds, um, which I'm 5'8". That's not a great weight to be at. 5'8", yeah. <laughs> 135. And um, so I started talking to a psychiatrist then and she was like, you should just go to the doctor and get a scope done. And my wife had uh, maxed out our out-of-pocket maximum. So thank you, Crystal. I could go get a scope for quote-unquote free. Um, and there was nothing wrong. There was just some inflammation. He's like, are you stressed at all? Like, is stuff going on? And I was like, oh, let me tell you. But uh, <laughs> Just start listing uh, the whole thing down. 
and then I just started all the symptoms I had just because went away. So it was stress. I literally had, it's another situation. I've created hell for myself. I thought I was sick. I had constant heartburn, nausea, couldn't swallow food sometimes. And it was because I thought on top of all the tour stuff, I also thought I was dying because my wife just did. And I was like, what if we leave our kids? What if we're orphaned again? What if they're, I didn't say these out loud because you got to stay strong for your kids yeah. and all that. But it's like, they definitely saw me not eating and the, and I didn't think of it as not eating. I just one day was like, I keep losing weight. I wonder how much I'm eating. So I did a calorie tracker and I was eating like 800 calories a day. Sheesh, um, man. So it's funny because after I got the scope done, everything got better. I went back to a healthy weight and things. So at least uh, I still struggle a little bit with that since stuff came back. Just because my wife's still going through stuff and my the psychiatrist said there's a lot. It's typical in couples, especially younger ones, if one has a near-death experience or passes away prematurely. Yeah. That their partner usually starts developing some kind of like fear that the same will happen to them because it almost doesn't feel real till someone next to you that's your age has something really bad happen to them because normally it's like your grandparents or your parents or it's not ever like the person next to you is the same age and uh so i think that was a hell that a lot of and it goes beyond just me like a lot of people create scenarios in their head that they lose sleep over and they are miserable and depressed and then those scenarios never come to fruition and it's like yeah. how much how many years of my life did I trim off just stressing over things that never happen or will never happen? Some of them, you know, do happen, but I'd say majority of the time they don't. And then yeah. um the third hell, which this one's the more like quote unquote political, it doesn't take a side or anything, but it's um We've created health through ourselves. And this is something I realized through my wife's condition. Her stroke was due to her birth control. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at like lawsuits and stuff. She took the birth control for one month and had four 98% clots in her brain after taking it for one month. And so we were like, there has to be like a lawyer that could help with this. We found out the company had already been sued like 80,000 times and settled in 2014 with a class action lawsuit. So they, that's another hell we create. And I know it's popular to go big pharma, but the fact that they were continued after the lawsuit to keep giving people this thing. And I think the stat was one in five women develop blood clots when taking this birth control and doctors were gave it to her and we're like, this has to be malpractice or this has to be, something because it's essentially ruined her health forever like she has to take a ton of medication and all this stuff so we kind of create hell through the things we allow or push and like that i'm saying like that the greater medical community may push and i'm not somebody that's strictly holistic i still will take medicine and i'll take an advil if i have a headache i'll do this but we're definitely put on a lot of uh, medications and stuff where it just creates more problems than it solves. And that seems like, I mean, I have my own story. I'm, like I said, I had esophagus issues. I took this uh, reflux medicine called the Meprazole for 10 years. And I just quit it last month. That doctor was like, I guess if you want to, because I was like, I really want to stop taking it because I was reading all these side effects of long-term use and long-term use was eight weeks and I was on it for 10 years. Wow. And he's like, with your dad's history, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't risk it, but I'm looking at these negative side effects of like Alzheimer's and osteoporosis and like people dying of normal illness because your stomach acid is low. It's, just, it's an acid reducer. Mm -hmm. So it's funny as I quit the medicine, had crazy heartburn, which is typical when you take some, because your body like over create, over uh, reacts to making it, like over corrects. And then I was okay. like, it's not going away. This sucks. And then I realized because uh, of a video on YouTube, it's like, actually, you might have too little because it destroyed the pumps in your stomach. Take this 
supplement. It's a stomach acid supplement. It actually puts more acid. So I was like, all right, I'll try this. And guess what? All the heartburn's gone. So this whole time wow. I was being treated to not have any. And so for 10 years, I was, and I may like my stomach acid may be messed up the rest of my life because I took that medicine. So it's not, I'll still see the doctor. I'll still get opinions and get scopes. I'm not somebody that's anti-medicine now, but it's like personal experience is just, that's one of the hells we kind of create with like medication. Like I think medication's important, but I think it's overused a lot of sure. times. And like my wife's, the reason she even like took her birth control wasn't for us not to have a child is because she has other issues that causes like heavy periods. And she's like, this will help ease the pain. <laughs> it ended up causing a million more issues than that one. So I'd say that's the three like big layers of the album name. That's a lot to unpack, obviously, but the fact that this company had over, like 80,000 people sue them already or yeah. settled and they're still prescribing it is very interesting. There's a lot to unpack there. Like you and Crystal didn't have children prior to adopting them at 13 and eight years old. That's a big change to go through as a couple. And then for her and you and the whole family to go through all the emotions that you did, like all while being locked in quarantine, correct? Yeah, we actually started fostering them before quarantine too. So Wow. That, and you I had mean, to homeschool. Yeah, we had to homeschool them. And <laughs> it sounds bad because now that I know, at the time I didn't know the kids. My wife did. Mm -hmm. They were her niece and nephew. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the time, it's like that conversation would have been really different if it's like, hey, by the way, you're going to lose your job for two years and all this. And it's like, would we have done it? But I feel like God... Uh, kind of put them in our life right then because oh. it kind of made it was still was it took weeks and weeks of us discussing if because we were kind of like throwing our hats in the ring as a last option because my profession and my wife's a flight attendant and all that and she didn't have health issues yet with any of that so it's kind of interesting I, you ask yourself like why god would you give me these kids and then give my wife a stroke and then take my job away and i'll and kind of looking back i'm like maybe it was um i don't know if it applies to her stroke but me being home from tour like i got to get to know the kids probably better than i would have ever gotten to know them with touring for sure on six seven months out of the year and I got yeah. probably more time with kids than any parent would ever hope to have consecutively without a break. <laughs> That's awesome. And the fact that you're able to raise the kids with your wife being a flight attendant, you being on tour six, seven months out of the year, you just finished up a tour with I Prevail, which is freaking incredible, dude. It's been very interesting. And to like circle back on the stress that you were going through, I had a bout that I guess would be a hell that I created with overworking and keeping myself stressed out for so long. Um, <laughs> a few weeks ago, um, I was out doing the uh, Blue Ridge Rock Festival and I ended up like developing a gastrointestinal infection from like i don't know exactly how it happened but a lot of it was stress and i ended up like the whole time i was there i guess over 72 hours not being able to eat or keep a water down or anything so like obviously i was super dehydrated super um pale no food in my stomach ended up in the er and it's like you don't necessarily think about these things when they're happening. Like yeah. when you wake up, start working on projects until you go to sleep, like not eating lunch, all these unhealthy things just spiral into something crazy. It all could have bypassed if you would just take care of yourself a little more, you know? And for the things that you went through as a family, I can't imagine the emotional toll that it took on you, but after listening to this record and then hearing about the brain surgeries and everything, I can, I can tell there's a little, a lot of that in the record, but a little glimpse for us from an outside perspective, looking in, like you were almost a single father yeah, with a very short amount of time with a teenager. Yeah. It's wild. And the fact that 
that's something that was almost like your new beginning, like one that you didn't ask for mm-hmm. is insane to think about, man. And I can't even put it into words. Like that is a lot to go through. And the fact that you're sitting here able to talk about it, uh, nor the less create a whole record about it is encouraging to hear that you're able to overcome that anxiety, overcome that depression, overcome those thoughts of no one's going to care about my band when we get out of this. Uh, with what I know, like you probably developed a lot more fans over the pandemic because they had time to sit there and watch on YouTube and get recommended for music videos and such like your career. I, I think after listening to this record, like is only going to grow. And with this being such a big leap for you going through the trauma, going through the emotional toll, going through adopting children and learning to homeschool, how has that changed your life as a songwriter? as a lyricist and even a musician? I'd say um, it's definitely made the, I understand what fans were going through because I would, I never really had crazy amounts of trauma throughout my life. So I'm really fortunate for that. But um, then I still haven't even scraped the surface of what some fans have gone through. But now I can uh, understand a lot better. Cause I'll be like, I had the moments where I thought she was gone and I, all those thoughts of like single father, um, a widower at 30 years old and all that. So, but there are fans that that has happened to and the reality did like come to fruition. So I would say with lyrics and with all that, obviously as sad as it is, um, tragedy breeds some of the best music so that's always gonna because i think people that go through that are looking for music they can relate to and now i'm able to write from a genuine place music about Mm. these tragedies and uh not just have it be like me trying to put myself in someone else's shoes i'll be like i was i was there and it uh, really helps On the negative with writing, it's a lot harder to find time with kids to write. So that's the, (laughs) that's the big negative. You would never be able to tell that from listening to it. And I'm excited for everybody to finally get to hear it. And with that being said, I want to do a deep dive into some of these songs as we were talking about before we hit the record button. Uh, One of my favorite songs on the record was actually a single is a single right now. Um, It's falling through the sky. What is the song about? How would you describe it lyrically? And what's the overall message behind it? So Falling Through the Sky is a song about um, not being prepared for trauma. Like I grew up in a really traditional Christian household. Everything was about uh, give it up to God and it'll be fine. And I never really had any traumatic events happen, fortunately, like that say the the biggest issue I had growing up was losing my grandpa and I was like 10 to 13, which um, really it's a, it's sad and it's never fun losing a family member, but we didn't, we didn't bond cause I was 10 and you know, you don't have that adult bond the same way you do. Like that's why it gets harder as you get older and you start actually like bonding over real life things like complaining about bills and complaining <laughs> about all that other stuff. <laughs> The Having normal political things. debates. Oh, yeah. Which, those are the best. You know, those actually might ease the pain. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, the uh, that's also just my dad had a cancer diagnosis. I think I was 18 or 19. And he's he survived. So it was like I that was probably the biggest scare I had uh, growing up. So, you know, I was like you know, I got this, I can handle this, just bury any anxiety you have, bury any sadness, it's cool. And I was always able to do that because, you know, there wasn't near as much as other people because I was very blessed to have a normal upbringing, a very trauma-free upbringing. Um, And then when everything happened during the pandemic with, you know, adopting the kids and my wife's health and everything, like all of a sudden the bury it and give it to God wasn't working too hard and i think it's because uh at the end of the day god's not supposed to shoulder everything and fix everything for you while you put in no effort 
Because yeah. that's a lot of people are like, you can't just sit back and say, God will provide as you lose your house and lose your cars. <laughs> and lo-. it's like, no, you actually have to go work and you actually have to do stuff. Um, and for me, that doing stuff or the lack of doing stuff was me at taking care of my mental health and becoming a mentally strong person. And I'd always thought I was mentally strong because I'm seeing all these people like being depressed or whatever. And I was like, well, that's not me just completely brushing off that I didn't have to deal with a fraction of what those people also had to deal with. So whenever uh, things got bad, it just hit me like a truck. And I was all of a sudden when you can't bury it, when the hole isn't big enough to bury everything and it all comes out, it's panic attacks, sleepless nights, not eating all that and not knowing how to deal with it. Cause I think, Unfortunately, when you build, when you have a lot of trauma growing up, a positive, if there can even be a positive to growing up with trauma, is you become, I've noticed it either destroys someone or it builds them into an incredibly strong, resilient person. Like some of the best leaders in the world, best motivational speakers, biggest innovators are people that came from troubled uh, childhoods. Yeah. Or, but that's not a very high percentage. So trauma is definitely not worth it. It's very few that do it. But I think there's no coincidence. Some of the, you know, biggest people in fields like motivational speaking and all that are people that grew from it and became stronger. Yeah. Now the downside is when you have a trauma free upbringing is you have zero tolerance for real trauma because you don't know what real trauma is. And then when it hits you, you're just like, because you weren't like, in a way, like micro dosed trauma throughout your life. So you have zero. I had no resilience to it. It just completely overtook me and destroyed me. And falling through the sky is about all that. That's why there's lyrics like feels like I'm falling through the sky, just free falling, (laughs) like everything's falling apart. Uh, Then the rebuilding life that I've killed. Like, it's just about anxiety killed life for me. Mm. Like life was, I wasn't enjoying life. I was letting all this time I should have appreciated be consumed with anxiety and panic and stuff like that. Running from reality. It's me against the gravity, like the gravity of the situation. It's me just trying to always run away from the reality of things. And then eventually it catches up. That's why it says, the world looks so much darker when your body hits the ground because yeah. it's like you finally just, you know, hit rock bottom as far as that. And I know there's still so much further you can go. And I think that's why that line, um, they say heaven's above and hell is below. So why do they both feel so close? And it's yeah. because you're so close to like, you have God and stuff here, but then at the same time, everything's awful. Yeah. And you're like, so it's just a lot of very, uh, that song's just dealing with not knowing how to deal with trauma. And I'd say I'm a lot stronger of a person now, uh, than I was back then because of everything I went through, but I would never wish any of that on anybody. Um, and I know there's people that had it way worse. I mean, Carl Anthony Towns in the NBA, I think he lost like eight family members to COVID and it's like, and that's, Something I've had to work on too, um, is I always see stuff like that and I'm like, I can't complain. This guy lost his whole family, but you do need to allow yourself to feel things, even if they're not big. Like, it's like, I can't downplay my wife almost dying because somebody did lose his wife. I can't say, yeah. well, I'm not allowed to mourn or I'm not allowed to deal with this because, or I'm not allowed to say this sucks because how can I say this sucks when somebody actually did lose their wife? And I think that's something that also drove me insane. I always had that attitude of like, well, how can I complain? I had a great upbringing. It's like, but yeah, maybe don't complain, but you're allowed to vent and you're allowed to get things off your chest. Cause I think it even got to the point where with praying and stuff, I wouldn't pray about things. Cause I'm like, why is this even worth praying about? Like God's getting prayers from people that have leukemia or people that just lost their child in a car accident. It's like, how could I complain about 
my wife almost died. It's like, but she didn't. So why are you? And it's like all that downplaying for myself. Uh, that's why that line in falling through the sky, I should have learned how to talk to all my demons, learn to let them go instead of holding on to them because I didn't think they were worth God's time or anyone else's time. Mm. Dude. And that song in particular, is just like, yeah, like at times when you're going through trauma, when you're going through the things that really suck in life, it does feel like you're falling through the sky and I love that you said when you're not microdosed with trauma as a child, like you have to acknowledge the things that people go through, like, yeah. especially when it's in your own life, you're like, what is going on? Why is this happening to me? Like, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And you sit there and try to barter with God when things are bad. But then when things are going great, it's like, what, like, are you actually going to communicate with God? Are you actually going to pray? Like, and it's interesting to think about when you're growing up, you learn these things that as you get older, you realize they're not as black and white as you once believed or thought they were. Yeah. And especially when it comes to mental health and trauma, when I was younger, before I had experienced anxiety and depression for myself, I had no clue how to relate with people or I thought they were just over exaggerating things until I started having crippling panic attacks that completely took over my entire life for about three years. And it's like, whoa, like it, it does feel like I'm falling through the sky. And it's you're so incense, like incense, desensitized to it that you look at people and you're like, well, somebody just tell them that it's not that way and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And then when you realize you have panic attacks, because looking back, somebody could have said that to me about the touring and people not caring about my band ever again, because they could have been like, you guys have a million monthly listeners. You just sold <laughs> 11,000 albums first week. How on earth are you worried about? It's just anxiety doesn't make sense a lot of times because yeah. people could point out to all the reasons you shouldn't be like if you're anxious and you're overworking yourself, somebody might look and you be like, yeah, but you're being productive. You're doing this. And it, that doesn't help your anxiety. It's just, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's something yeah. I had to learn because I used to look at people and like, why don't they just not be stressed out? And I realized how dumb of a mindset that was. Dude, you, I just went through that, like yeah. overworking the crap out of myself. And it's like, why not just don't do that? So I've just taken like less. healthy steps. Yeah, like work less, like it, on my phone, like I no longer have any kind of email access. Like that is yeah. exactly what I needed, like uh, being out at dinner and just start checking emails. And it's like, what are you doing, dude? Like you're supposed to be calming down. You need to and have a time where you're clocked out for the day. Oh, yeah, of course, dude. And especially the part of the song where you're just like, where nobody hits the ground. And it's like, that reminds me when you see like Ryan Kirby or mm -hmm. you meet Ryan Kirby in person, you hear your voice. You're like, where is that coming from? Yeah. <laughs> you have <laughs> such a growl and such a screaming voice. And it's like, where did you even learn how to do that? Like, I, it's insane, especially that 24 second growl you've been doing on the I Prevail tour. Like. I get tired thinking about that. I'd probably like pass out and be purple. So that would be me falling through the sky. Like yeah, everybody be like, that dude just passed out. <laughs> he's falling to the state, falling through the sky, AKA from the stage down to the ground. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. And the song is so catchy and meaningful. I'm so glad that y'all made it a single to where people can just kind of get a warm up for what they're going to experience through the record. And the next song that I wanted to talk about is, I would say Falling Through the Sky and In the Other Side are my favorite songs on the record by far. Um, could you break down End and just tell us a little bit about it as well? End is basically uh, just me describing the night that I wasn't sure if my wife was going to survive or not. And it was the first time like I talked about it Falling Through the Sky. I never had real trauma or stuff like that. My dad had cancer, but it was stage one. So the most dramatic, he never had to do chemo or anything. So the most dramatic that got was, oh, he's going to have surgery to remove the cancer. And then they did. And then it was over. Um, so with her, I'd never, especially no car wrecks, no anything. And I'd say it was kind of like, because for her, I was watching her deteriorate. She 
was slowly so she came home she was at her friend's birth in tulsa with her friend from arkansas celebrating her birthday she puked i think she said 11 times that night Mm. and her head was just she thought she was having like an aneurysm Mm -hmm. um so her head was just throbbing and like so much pain that's why she was puking was out of pain because it was so bad and she's also in Tulsa, and this is during the pandemic, so flying is not as easy <laughs> to do. Oh, yeah. And whenever, and if you're puking, everyone thinks that you have COVID, so they're going to be... Fortunately, she got on the plane, and then she got... Because she didn't want to go to the hospital there, because she's really smart, and she looked up their like neuro department and stuff, because she knew something was wow. wrong with her head, and they had really low scores on their neuro stuff. And she's wow. like, and we live in Dallas, Fort Worth. There's some really good hospitals because it's a huge metro area. Mm-hmm. Um, so she managed to get on the flight, went down, went to the ER. Um, they didn't even give her scans. They just asked her if she's pregnant. Um, she wrote out a whole thing. Doctor like didn't even read it and sent her home. They just said, oh, it's probably migraine. She's like, I've never had migraines. So over the next week, things just kept getting worse. She got to the point where, like, she could barely walk, as you do when you're having a stroke. And she was not eating. She wasn't – she was starting to lose motor function. So she was, like, very, like, this isn't a migraine. I need to – so we went to, like, a bigger hospital in – Dallas Fort Worth and they finally did a scan and I guess she had four or five clots like her jugular was 98% clotted and so they took her in and all I got was a call from the nurse or the last I heard from her my wife was that they're gonna they might have to send me somewhere because this was during COVID also the hospital beds were pretty full Mm -hmm. also it was during a deep freeze in texas it was like negative 10 and wow we don't have plows or salt trucks in dfw so it's like an ice skating rink so having to drive back and <laughs> forth uh luckily our car had all-wheel drive never thought i'd have to use it in texas but we did yeah um, sounds like atlanta when when it snows or like we get black ice they just shut the whole city down like, yeah they're like we don't have the stuff to take care of this so just be careful does Dallas Fort Worth go? Uh, we're prepared this time, and then just nothing. Basically, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. That's just That's funny good. to me. <laughs> so the last I heard was that she was going to have to have neurosurgery, and I'm looking at the. They basically said if it gets worse, they're going to have to do a surgery, which has like a seventy percent success rate. Which I'm like, that's not a good success rate and because of covid i like wasn't allowed in there a lot of this time no family i mean you all saw the thing where like people were dying and they weren't allowed to have family in and they would just show it on an ipad and stuff like so it was during that part of the pandemic um it was during the three month period where texas didn't that actually cared about it yeah Uh, the rest of the time they (laughs) did same with georgia yeah it's like uh uh, what's a mask (laughs) it was like uh it just happened to be during where texas took it seriously um so she i did eventually i was eventually able to go in with her once they got her a room and all that and this song takes place in the time in the room where i genuinely don't know what's going to happen she can barely speak they're giving her blood thinners hoping it can their goal is to make it less bad or like not progress anymore. Cause they're like, if it cannot progress, we can avoid the surgery. Cause the surgery is really risky. You have to like go in through her veins and into her head. And if you accidentally do anything wrong, then you die. So, um, they are really trying to avoid it. And even in large metros like this, there's not a lot of people that can perform those surgeries. There's like a handful because it's such a specialized thing, like going in through veins and all that. So they really try to avoid it because you have to like share five of these types of doctors for the whole Metroplex because brain surgery is not like an everyday mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, fortunately, they the medicine did stop it, though. But the whole album is like 
dealing with the prospects of losing her and uh just like the other side is talking about like the other side of this like I don't think I'll survive the other side. The other side is living life without her, being a single dad, doing all, like, just the idea of all that. And uh, that's why it even got to the side where it's like, I don't, I would rather die too. That's why it's like, I'll follow you to the other side. Yeah. Um, And then the end of the song is kind of the realization of, because that was my first brush ever with, like, death. Like, she didn't pass away, but it was the first time that was like a realistic mm-hmm. thing and staring death. And that's why the one liner death comes for us all. It says fighting with fate, facing reality. There's no escape, no refuge. I can see it. death comes for us all. And it's Which, like, cause I had dealt with so little of it my whole life. It's like mm-hmm. the realization that at the time she is 28 or 29. And I'm like, yeah. it doesn't matter. It comes for everyone. It's just a matter of when, not yeah. if. And that was kind of what drove me into like a lot of the stuff with being like a hypochondriac and all that with me thinking something is wrong at all times. And so, yeah, that song is just a description. All the lyrics are kind of just describing what's happening with the situation and me battling with like what happens after this. If yeah. Yeah. And the fact that you had to go through that is and were able to go through that and she survived she's still here like there's still going to be some things that aren't necessarily the same as they were but you were able to work through that i still have to face it every like i said i think yesterday she's about to go in and have her third brain surgery so every time she goes in it's almost like refacing those because she had like veins collapse and they have to go put things into them to try to make them open up again and it's like every time she goes to have that done it's like oh here goes another stressful day of like the idea of losing her yeah and the line or i don't even know what you would call it that was the sickest breakdown that i've ever heard in my life by the way (laughs) the death comes for us all one well, it keeps you on your toes too. It's like it duh, 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 duh. <laughs> I was like, I've listened to that probably over a hundred times at this point, and it just never gets old. So, congratulations on that. And the success of this record is going to be interesting to watch for me personally, especially getting to hear like the stories behind it. Like you learn to appreciate it a whole lot more, and the fact mm. that this record is a lot heavier than the last is like. It's also heavier lyrically because you went through something so traumatic, man, like, and you even learned to sing in different ways in this, it seems like. And I think y'all put a video out about that on Instagram. It's like, um, Tuck isn't doing all the singing at this point. Like you're actually learning and then being able to do it live. Like you've never had to sing without like being able to hide behind some sort of, uh, tracks or the loudness of the guitars and everything like that's anxiety driven all on its own. So you're pushing yourself to a whole new level of artistry and performance art, being able to provide fans with something super meaningful, especially like whether you've gone through something traumatic or not, after listening to this interview, after hearing the record, it's almost like you've, you've accessed a certain part of your brain, like your personal brain that is just really deep and personal. And it's crazy. Like I'm even left a little speechless hearing that, like, you know, you're, she's about to have that third brain surgery and it's like, you know, it's not over yet. Like there's still battles in this war that are going to be fought, but you're handling it right. I don't think there's a wrong way to handle it, but all right. (laughs) It's just wild, right? Yeah, there we go. We've got a guest. He's trying to rub his face on the microphone. (laughs) It feels good, Dad. Benji, what's up, dude? But for this album as a whole, what message do you want listeners to walk away with? I'd say um, just being very conscious of like the hells we create for ourselves and the hells we create for others through our decisions. Kind of like I was saying, the three parts that it's Mm -hmm. specifically about the hell we create for others with our poor decisions. Like today, if I started to decide to do like 
crazy hard drugs. Mm. It's not just me that's affecting. It's affecting my wife. It's affecting the kids. It's affecting my parents. It's affecting. It can create a whole scenario that creates makes their life horrible. Because I'd lose yeah. my job. I would lose the house. I'd lose. And so that's one example, same with like what their parents had put them through and the foster system and all that. And then hells we create for ourselves. Like an example that would create a hell for ourselves. Anxiety is the big one. Like we were saying, we create these issues that are in our head, whether it's, uh, you know, anxiety that no one will ever care the, about the band ever again whether you're with your partner and you have this anxiety due to past traumas of being like cheated on or something and you can't trust. So you create scenarios where they're going to leave you one day. Um, it just creates these hells that probably will never happen. Yeah. But it's almost like self-fulfilling prophecies whenever you do stuff like that. (laughs) So like, um, cause your anxiety can push people away too, which creates more hell for yourself. So, and then, like I said, the whole thing with like the birth control she took and pharmaceuticals and how we over prescribe medicine or we eat bad, that can create a hell for ourselves. Health is also something we can, I mean, if you smoke cigarettes every day, like a pack a day, and then when you're 60, you get lung cancer, yeah. there's probably a direct line to the pack of cigarettes you were smoking every day and obviously that's not always the case but it's not helping and it's like we make decisions every day that can create hell for ourselves so i'd say the takeaway from the record is just being aware of am i creating this for myself or for others when you do make a decision it's kind of like those days when you're just feeling great, nothing's wrong with your body, and you decide Taco Bell is a good thing to have for dinner, yeah, and, and you, you create a hell for yourself. You do. The bathroom <laughs> is hell next. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, it can even go on micro levels like that, where you're just yeah. like, or you know, when you get that milkshake, and you're like, that was a bad idea. That was so bad for me, but it was yeah. so good at the same time. So if there's someone out there that's created some sort of hell for themselves, or they're going through something traumatic right now, a personal message from Ryan Kirby, what would that be? Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to open up. Um, you don't even have to directly ask for help. You could write music. You could create art as a way to express it. That's what I did with this record. And it really helped. And I think the biggest thing is being able to talk about it. And don't think that any issue is too small to talk about. Because I made that mistake for a long time. And eventually a bunch of small issues turn into a large issue. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, everybody, if you're listening, be sure to check out The Hell We Create on October 28th. And go check out some of the merch. It's phenomenal. The artwork is crazy. I just... I'm in love with the record, so I'm so proud of you and the guys for creating something so meaningful for people. We're going to have the links for all this stuff in the description below, and uh, be sure to check out the band's website for upcoming tour dates and such. And if you're struggling today, please, 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 if you're watching on YouTube, you can comment in the comments below, and the heart support support wall is linked into this video to where people will be able to respond and provide some help in this time of need. We love you guys so much. If you're going through those moments, know that you're not alone and that it will get better. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye now.